right, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a lot of people here and thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, so I'm Lacey, I'm the community manager for the Shadows Edge game. It's a free mobile game for teens and young adults facing chronic illness and mental health challenges that was created by the Diddy Meat Project. And um, I'm here today with Shani Thornton. She's a certified child life specialist who also runs the website and blog childlifemommy.com. And I wanted to start out with uh, asking Shani, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and explain what you do in your profession? Yeah, thank you um, for having me, first of all, and welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, yes, so I'm Shani Thornton. I have been a child life specialist for about 14 years. And I um, started in the New York City area in a hospital setting. And I eventually organically kind of just moved into a community-based setting. So I've been doing private practice for child life for over five years. I started it in the New York area. And then when I relocated back to my hometown in Northern California, I went ahead and relaunched it here after kind of getting settled. So um, child life specialists typically are usually in a hospital and we're there to really support pediatric patients and their families cope with a lot of the medical trauma and the challenges of being ill and being in the hospital. Um, we're very diverse. We have a very strong skill set that we all know, and we can actually work with children who are just facing like life's challenges. So <clears throat> for my private practice, I see populations of children who have um, an illness who are going in for a medical or dental procedure. I work with a lot of children of adult patients, um, especially with hospice and helping children cope with end of life. And then I do a lot of grief support for families. So I work with families within their own homes and I also do telehealth. And I also um, provide a lot of workshops for my community um, and, and kind of, in overall doing a lot of different uh, events and workshops for families and different caregivers. So child life and private practice is very similar to the hospital. It's all about, you know, preparation and education to help explain things that are developmentally appropriate for children and families. So I do a lot of this with grief support as well. So I'm helping children understand what's happening to their loved one with the end of uh, life stages. I'm preparing them for funeral or memorial services. And I'm also helping them just kind of re get back in the groove of things, right? Of transitioning back into school if they took some time off. And I'm using all the different interventions that we use as child life specialists. You know, we're very um, child center, play-based, um, creative arts and using a variety of like bibliotherapy and creating social stories so that kids can really understand what's happening and have a, a sense of um, power and control through it. And uh, what you do is like just uh, absolutely amazing. Um, such a unique need that every kid at some point in their life needs. And um, now that we're a year into the COVID-19 pandemic and there's finally a vaccine, Many of us are so excited that soon those who are high risk will be able to be vaccinated and that maybe soon our lives will be able to return to some kind of sense of normalcy. But I mean, for a lot of young people, the announcement of the vaccine really hasn't changed their world too much, uh, whether they're a younger child or a teen or a young adult. Uh, some schools are still meeting through virtual learning. Masks and social distancing are still necessary in many places. And many uh, groups and organizations are still reluctant to host any large community events like sports or school dances, things like that. And the world is seemingly struck in like this weird, strange limbo between quarantine and progress, I guess you could say. But this is a great time for us to all begin to help young people learn to deal with this grief that, you know, a lot of people have been carrying around this past year. Um, you know, almost everyone has experienced some loss of some sort in their life, but in this past year, it's been experienced on a grander scale. And many have lost their jobs and financial security, you know, for older, you know, young adults or for the parents, um, which would trickle down, to, you know, as stress down to um, their kids. And if it's not that, people have lost group activities, sports or social circles, and even 
on a grander scale, people have lost their loved ones. So that's why we wanted to have this topic today because it's so relevant to so many young people. And um, I mean, it's hard enough for us adults to deal with this grief that we've been dealt this past year, but how do we help the kids and the teens deal with this? And so I was wondering about in your practice, Shani, how do you first go about helping a child or a teen deal with the grief? How do they, how do we start on the right foot toward healing so that we can help them eventually grow past this and heal? Yeah. Well, I think um, you hit exactly what we've been experiencing during this pandemic. The pandemic is grief. Everything involved is grief, right? All the loss, the loss of control, the loss of normalcy, the routines, and all of our self-care tools that we would typically have, right? Of being in social gatherings, sports, activities, dining out, was all closed off, even the gyms, right? So that physical release. So we were put um, through a really traumatic kind of shock last um, last spring. And it's, it has definitely continued this year and is still continuing. Um, I do think that one of those things with the pandemic though, is this acknowledgement that we need to have of this pendulum, right? Of emotions. Like, so there are some points during this year where you might've felt incredibly fearful, very frightened, locking everybody down. We are not going out. We are staying contained. And then it might, that pendulum might swing all the way to the other side where you're like, okay, I think we're good. Like, I, I think we can get back out there and do things. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, you kind of go back a little bit. So it's this constant back and forth. And what it's doing is just causing a lot of stress, anxiety. Um, there's definitely probably conflicts between families, right? And family members of like one family member feels like we're okay. And then the other ones, no, we're not. So it's, it's a lot of um, high intensity emotions, mixed with grief and it's incredibly challenging. Um, I can say that when I work with families, even prior to the pandemic, anytime I explain grief to families, you know, they're usually through that crisis stage when they're contacting and, and they're just so overwhelmed. And I say to them, look, grief is not linear. We are not going to go from point A to point Z and be okay. It's a big, hot mess. That is what grief is. And this image is like spot on. That's exactly how you feel. And there's times where it can be really intense. And then you kind of feel a little bit of a calming. And then it goes back to that intensity. And there's different things that can trigger that intensity. So when I work with families, I go in there and I'm kind of just really assessing where everybody's at. You know, every person grieves differently. It's their own personal journey. There's no right or wrong. The way they grieve, it might be very different the way I grieve, but within a family, right? So this is what I talk to parents about all the time is that in your family, your whole family is grieving, but individually, every single family member, they're also grieving. So it's kind of these two like parallels that are going at the same time. And I think that when we bring awareness to that, and that validation and the education about grief, it helps to kind of bring a sense of calming and just feeling like somebody is witnessing them and that they're validating them and they're gonna help them cope with this. Um, the personal journey too of grief is, is how you were raised, right? So, so in some families, they may not have talked about death and dying. They might not even acknowledge it. The person might be dead and they, they just don't talk about it. There's no anniversaries. There's no celebrations. There's no sharing of stories. It's just, you don't talk about it. And what happens is if that's kind of how you're raised and you're, you know, that's what's being modeled to you as a child, when you then become an adult and have kids, you might do similar things. Um, but then there's other families that might be, incredibly open and they want to talk about it and they want to get the support. And sometimes when you actually have two of those then get together, right, who are married and then have children, it can also bring in some um, challenges with, with parenting. And so having somebody come in and kind of just acknowledge that and then provide them with the tools um, can definitely help. So I would say that I really, I just assess and I kind of 
just see where they're at and I meet them where they're at. Um, I don't, I don't push, um, but I, I provide the right tools and just that presence of, um, of witnessing where they're at and that helps them cope. Great. And, um, so let's say this, there's a more immediate sense of there's someone there, a loved one or a friend or, you know, a parent, anything like that is actively in the stage of about to pass away. How do we address the grief in a more immediate sense? And how do, like, let's say we have a very short amount of time to say goodbye and to address what's going on. Like, what can we do in this circumstance to help uh, a young person in that kind of sped up time frame of that happening? Yeah, so that's, that's that crisis moment. Um, I contract with a hospice agency out here and, you know, I always tell them when you have a, when you take a family on and you take that patient on and you find out that they have children within the home, automatically get that referral to me because I should work with that family right away from the get-go. Ideally, a diagnosis is when, you know, child life should be able to intervene to work with children of adult patients. But with a hospice, like as soon as they come on hospice, I should come in. Usually what happens though um, and I know this is with a lot of child life specialists in a lot of different areas is sometimes we don't get called and get that referral until like they're an active dying stage. And I mean, it's just chaos and it, it's really traumatic. And um, then we kind of come in and we're like, okay, let's assess it all and let's figure out how to help them cope. Um, and that's when you really come in and you do legacy building and memory making. Um, it's kind of the language that child life specialists use. And essentially what that is, is the first part, it would be educating the children about what's happening, educating the teens about what is happening to their loved one in, in a way that they can developmentally understand it. And then giving them tools where they can create concrete items that will be forever mementos, right? So I incorporate um, lots of play and lots of different books and stories. My go-to book, every single family has got to be The Invisible String. Um, I also love Sun Kisses, Moon Hugs, um, Moving in Forever. Some of those are listed right there, but these are books where there's a theme about the loved one dying or about the separation. And, and just being in that metaphor of the book and reading it to kids can help them feel like, okay, they're starting to understand a little bit and it's, and it's less pressure of like, tell me how you think about your mom dying. Like that's not how, we, how it works. It's through the metaphor and it's through just kind of just witnessing them. And then from there, I do a lot of different activities. So the invisible string, um, you can see in that picture, I read the story. And then I give them the opportunity to create their own string. And essentially what that does, it reminds them that no matter where they are in life, they're forever connected to loved ones. And I think it's wonderful when that person is still alive and they, I've had kids do handprints. I've had them do tracing their loved one's hand. I've had them, this family went and printed out pictures of their loved one, and then they would find how long their string was. They took beads to represent memories and that person's favorite color. And the person was still alive and they would go in and then they would show them. And it was this really powerful, engaging, therapeutic, just experience. And um, that, I mean, honestly, for me, when I come in and work with families, I feel like it is such an honor to be with a family during the most pivotal moments in their life. And I'm really just a facilitator. I'm truly there to just kind of help give this space where they can create and, and feel this sense of safety to express. So in the invisible string activities are always my go-to. Canvas handprints, that's another one where you can kind of create those mementos. So, um, you know, I've had, I brought in big giant canvases where I've had the whole family put, you know, their prints on. And then sometimes they'll actually add additional stuff to 
their handprints, whether they make them into butterflies or animals. Um, I've done fingerprint charms are also another favorite um, activity of mine. So either using actually clay mold from a company where you can do a fingerprint mold and you send it away and then they um, turn it into a, into a charm or you can use it with model magic. Um, I just recently had a family where I gave them a variety of different model magic colors and then they used markers to change up the colors and they created, I mean, their creativity is, is just therapeutic in itself and what they, what they did. And they just made all of these different um, charms and they would have both their thumbprints and their loved one's thumbprint on there. And it was, I mean, there was laughter, there was smiling, they were listening to music. It's, it's the experience of, yes, this is incredibly hard. This is happening. The person is dying. But how can we make it a place where it's just therapeutic and it's still like the family's coming together? I mean, I could sit back and I'm just like, oh my gosh, they like playing their favorite songs and they're talking and they're giggling. And it gives this like weight is almost kind of just like lifted off of them to find a, a place where they can um, start to begin to process. And that's, you know, it's, it's amazing how such a dark time in someone's life, it's, you know, as just horrible as losing a loved one, there's a bit of a beauty in the fact that they can sit and do these things to, you know, honor the person that they love that's going to pass away or, or has. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing that you get to be a part of that. And I love hearing that story. And I know there's many other people here that just are probably tearing up a little bit actually like me over here <laughs> thinking oh my god that's beautiful but um so so this is where I want to kind of like on the subject of what you were just talking about when you're having those discussions like while you're doing these activities what is the when we talk to the kids about the loss of a loved one what is the best way to talk about it of course there will be differences on how to do this you know with a toddler versus a grade school kid or a teen, you know, or versus even a young adult. Um, can you touch on a few of the key differences to be aware of, of talking about grief and loss with the kids? Yeah. So that comes down to, to development, right? So just like how we would explain um, an illness or a procedure to different age groups, it's the same thing with grief and loss. So um, you have to come from the standpoint of knowing that when they hit different developments, the way you provide the information is going to be very different. So oftentimes they, you know, people might think that infants and, and toddlers don't understand death. You're right. They don't understand the permanence. They don't understand um, the abstract because they're not there. Their brains aren't developed there yet. However, they know something's up. They know something's different. They, um, they can sense it, right? You might notice that the, the babies are um, more clingy or maybe there's some regression. Maybe there's more irritability. There's just, there's a change and they can recognize it. So those coping strategies of kind of helping them um, and what I do with her families and, and the parents is like, explain that they have to have a lot of structure. You have to have those routines and having a consistent caregiver to really bring in the attachment part, right? They need to feel that they need to feel the soothingness. Um, even if there's, you know, whether it's pictures or, you know, if it's a loved one's um, shirt, something where it's the sense of smell, like incorporating that to soothing can definitely help this age group. For preschool age, they are, I love preschoolers. They're so fun. Um, but they're emotional, like surging little beings, but they don't quite understand their feelings yet. Like they, they're still learning to name them right? And then they're learning about where they are in their body and how they feel them. So when it comes to grief and loss, we have to, um, we have to be able to help them with that. So you have to be able to name and validate their feelings and, and do it in through, through books and activities and art. But 
you want to give them very concrete language that's going to help them understand the permanence of death, with, which they're not there yet. They don't understand the permanence yet. They, um, they're, they're here and now, and they're, they're very egocentric as well. So they are going to be asking a ton of questions. Well, where is daddy? Can we go see him? He's, you know, and if somebody says, oh, he's in heaven, uh, where's heaven? Can we go there? Can we get in the car? It's up in the sky. Can I take a balloon? Like that's how they think. And they're going to just keep asking those questions. You have to have a lot of patience and um, you have to, again, have those routines and you need to just give them very clear, concrete language in simple terms and know that you're probably going to have to repeat that like 900 and 75 times, but that that's okay, right? That's part, it's normal. Um, so, and they also, they're going to play out death and loss and caregiving and rescuing and heroes like over and over and over again. It's so normal. School age, they're starting to understand the permanence, which then kind of sets in the fear of, is something going to happen to me? can this happen to you? Like they were here, now they're not here. They're, it can bring up a lot of anxiety and big emotions of confusion and guilt and shame. Um, they are also at that stage where there's a lot of curiosity about what's happened. They have a lot of curiosity about the body. How did it stop working? What happens? What happens with cremation? What happens with burial? And sometimes that can be a little off-putting for parents. They're like, I don't even like, is that, is that weird? Is that morbid? I'm like, it's so normal. They want to know. Um, just like with kids who are in the hospital and they're ill, they usually want to really understand the body and how it works. And it's just this curiosity stage. So um, you have to continue to name and validate. You need to keep those routines and it's also really helpful to give them outlets of continuing to do some like memory making, right? So, so even though the person's died, honoring them with drawing pictures, creating art, writing stories, where they can still feel very connected to that person who's died. Um, adolescents, they're abstract thinkers, meaning they, they get it past the concrete level they understand the permanence and they understand how it's going to impact them in the future. So if an adolescent loses a mom or a grandmother or somebody really important in their life, they're going to realize, wow, at graduation, they're not going to be there. I know that when I get married, my dad's not going to be able to walk me down the aisle. That sits in with them. And, and it's really hard for them to kind of just process and then find the right outlets to express it because they're also super social at this stage. They've already kind of are, they're pulling away from their caregivers. They're becoming more independent and they're trying to find their identity. And when you throw in a loss, it can just mix that up because they might not feel comfortable actually going to their peers and talking about this because it might make them feel even more of an outsider. So finding a grief group or finding a trusting adult that they can go to finding healthy outlets of like sports or things that they're really interested in to keep them, you know, expressing and getting that, um, getting those emotions and that physical energy out is really important. So like art and theater could also be similar to getting that out like sports. Yes. Yes. Music, art, drama, all of it. And, and that's an incredibly expressive outlet. And it's really helpful. And then I think too, just giving them, um, acknowledging that the stress can then conflict with, um, with their concentration in school and the academic pressure. So there should be conversations with the school about, um, you know, either shortening up assignments or giving them some leeway, giving them some extra time, giving them a supportive tutor, somebody who's going to be able to help them work through that because that can be really hard. And knowing too that there are some teens who are really private, that they, are, they don't want to express it and they don't want to talk about it and share it. And maybe they find a couple of people where they can do that and, and respect that. 
um, try to avoid like prying it out of them. The one thing to know is that, you know, I had said this before that you're going to kind of, you need to reprocess, right? Reprocess um, into the next milestone, the, ne the next developmental milestone. So what I mean is like when this happens to a preschooler and they lose a loved one and they're using all these tools and we're expressing it when they hit, when they hit school age, it's almost like they need re-education on it again. So you have to come back in and you have to re-educate them again on what happened because it just had a different milestone, a different development. Um, <clears throat> it's the same when, when child life specialists work with somebody in the hospital and they might have a, a diagnosis at a preschool age, when they hit um, a school age, you have to re-educate them again, even though they've experienced the hospital, they understand treatments, it's different. They're, they they now need the information explained to them and shared with them with different coping strategies at that new uh, development. And uh, do you have any like little nuggets of wisdom on like, let's say a parent has a toddler, a school age and a teen, like, so that way, what are your nuggets of wisdom that you might have on when you're having to split your, you know, how you're approaching each of your kids differently on the same subject? Do you have any advice on that? I think to just, um, to know that, that your kids are all grieving differently, but they're all in a different developmental stage, right? So the same thing that you would explain to them on other information about, like maybe going to the doctor or maybe going to the dentist, um, the way you would explain it to your, a teenager is very different than the way you're going to explain it to your preschool age. So, so I guess my, my tip would be to just know that they're all different and that your wording and the information has to be different as well. But knowing that you just continue, everybody's going to need validation of their emotions. They're, they're all going to need outlets and tools. So those are all going to kind of stay the same. It might look different for each one, but those parts are really important. Okay. Cause you know, when loss happens, sometimes you've got not, you don't, your kids may not be even in the same developmental stage. So that I wanted to bring that up just cause I can only imagine that, you know, it's already hard enough trying to approach the subject uh, patiently with one child. And when you've got another one who needs it completely differently. So that, that's something uh, that's really important. Um, and so I wanted to touch base on the question of, is it possible that some of the behaviors that parents are seeing are actually grief? And I mean, could grief come out in the form of other complex emotions like anger or disappointment? And do you have any tools and activities for kind of getting to the root of figuring out if this behavior is grief? Yeah, well, kids are, um, kids are funny because they're not going to come to you and, and say, I'm really sad today because grandma died. I mean, they might, they, that might happen, but usually what happens is depending on their age, it's going to come out in meltdowns. It's going to come out in regression. It's going to come out with them having a hard time concentrating in school. That's where you're going to see it. That's where you're going to see grief um, and, and those types of behaviors and those reactions. So emotions, yeah, because grief, that is all it is. It's that hot mess of emotions. So we need to give them the validation. We need to be able to teach them where they, um, what their feelings are, where they feel them in their body, and what are ways to cope and manage with them, right? And we also need to normalize that all emotions are accepted, it's really easy for us to accept emotions of like happy and, um, you know, being shy, but the other challenging emotions, the vulnerable emotions, sadness, even anger, anger is always mass sadness, um, guilt, jealousy, resentment, shame, like those are really heavy, deep emotions that we need to be able to also acknowledge and normalize. It's totally normal to have those feelings um which so they could I, probably be totally misunderstood like at school and a kid who's just lost a grandparents acting out and being rude to the teacher when and then they get sent into detention and you know 
some, it, some people might easily label a kid as, you know, a bad kid, not that there's a bad kid, but, you know, that kind of that, you know, common occurrence of where the kid gets labeled as acting out for different reasons when really they just need that grief addressed. Would you, would you say that happens often? All, all the time. I had, um, <clears throat> We were talking about the pandemic, right? And then losing a loved one during the pandemic. I was working with a family and the day we went shelter in place was the day that the mom actually died. And um, so this past year, he was preschool age. He was four and a half when I started working with him. He was kicked out of two schools, two preschools, um, because he was so angry. He was, you know, he would be fine. And all of a sudden he just went to 10 and he could not control it. He could not self-regulate his emotions. And, um, you know, he was throwing chairs and he was hitting and the schools were like, we can't deal. So they just kicked him out. Um, so I was working with the new school and I was working with the family and I told the new school, like, you cannot kick this kid out. Like the last thing he needs is abandonment again. The last, the last thing he needs is to feel like he's doing something wrong when he's really essentially asking for help. Yes. The way he knows. Yes, exactly. And so I went in and did like a whole in service with the, the school and he's doing great there. Um, yes, he's, there's been little outbursts here and there, but they know he is coping with his mom's loss. He's coping with living with, um, two different family members now. So his dad and his aunt are, are split between their times. He's dealing with the pandemic, with um, having these new siblings at home all the time with him. Like there was so much loss and so much change that this tiny little preschooler just couldn't handle it. And so it comes out in behavior. So it's really important to incorporate activities and, and art to help them. Um, and I, I, like I said, I use a lot of, a lot of bibliotherapy with themes, and then I usually do an activity around it. So fun, fun activities that help with anger, volcano making, uh, toilet paper target. That's one of my favorites uh, where you take it a target. Fun. <laughs> it's so fun. You take a target and you put, um, you have kids like write or draw things that might make them angry, things that might make them sad things that might make them feel ashamed and they put it up there and then they take, you know, wet toilet paper and they just start launching it at the target. And it just like, bah, and you go from this like awkward, like, I can't believe we're doing this. Like they might feel a little weird to laughter and giggles. And it's a physical release. Um, that's a lot of fun. You know, we, we talked about, um, masking emotions, right? So in the, there's a picture up here of that mask and this was also done by a, this was a kindergartner whose dad had died um, from cancer related to 9-11. He was a first responder. And I remember working with him and his mom was, she was amazing, but she was just really on him about like expressing sadness. She was like, he's not showing he's sad. I don't understand it. And I'm like, he's so sad. He just, it's so vulnerable. He can't, he can't express it. So I did this activity with them with a the mask. And we talked about how you no know, superheroes will wear a mask and they turn into that other powerful character. But people also wear a mask. We might show people how we feel on, on the outside, but on the inside, we're different, right? And so he got it and he chose his colors and he identified it to an emotion. So the red, he said, was anger, which was the majority of the mask. The brown, he said, was joy, which was right by the mouth. And he had the best sense of humor. He coped so well with humor and he had a great smile. So I was like, it's so funny. He put it right there. The inside of the mask was completely blue. And he said it was sadness. And it was like one of those moments where I'm like, do you think you can share this with mom? And he was like, yes. And I was like, score, we're going to work on communication. We're going to advocate and we're going to help you communicate this to mom. And as soon as he did it and she turned it over, she had tears in her eyes and the light bulbs were going off. And she was like, I get it. Like, I, I see he's so, he's so sad. He's devastated, but it's just too painful to show it. So he masks it with anger. 
Um, so that's another, I mean, definitely emotions have to be addressed. They can also be addressed in therapeutic play. I use a lot of like open-ended play materials, sand, um, doll houses, medical play to help kids express themselves. And it's really their, their time to shine. It's their time to have all that control. I hold back. I not, I'm not leading the play. I'm not asking questions. I'm really there to kind of just reflect what's happening to name and validate emotions and, th and things that I'm seeing. And they, I mean, they, the stories and the things that come out in their play um, about grief, oh my goodness, the amount of like with sand play, the loss, a constant burying, pulling them out, burying them, pulling them out. Like it's so repetitive, but it's so healthy. Um, this little boy too, he's burying he played with the sand for like 20 minutes of just like dumping, playing, dumping, just normal, having fun. And I had a uh, container of the inside out characters and he, out of all of them, took sadness, put it in there, covered up sadness. It goes, we're going to bury sadness. And I was like, oh, how ironic. You're all, he's also the kiddo who, um, who was kicked out of the preschools. Who is just kind of burying and reacting, burying and reacting. Yes. And, and for him, it was just, it's so painful for him to show that emotion of sadness that and he was burying it. Um, so a lot of, a lot of different types of therapeutic outlets. And again, too, with grief, you know, continuing to hold that memory, continuing to create, create things, even though that loved one has died in honor of them. So memory boxes are so healthy and and gives the kids a space where they can put items, either, you know, pictures or mementos, or even have kids write or draw things that their loved one gave them that's not a tangible item, such as, um, you know, you have, you have their eyes, you have their sense of smile, or their sense of uh, humor, you have their smile. And um, it gives them a space where they can go to, they can share it with others, or they can keep it private. Um, and constantly, you know, incorporating different outlets where they can have, have a space where they can honor them. So the yellow balloon, my yellow balloon was something that it's a great book about loss and it doesn't have to be about death. It's just, it's about loss. And I had a, I read it to this, um, school age boy and he then took a scrap piece of paper and he wrote down on there, um, his dad had died. So he like basically wrote a couple of sentences to his dad of like, I miss you. I hope you're proud of me. I love you. And then pulled it up and put it inside this balloon, blew it up and tied it up. Um, obviously I couldn't release it, right? Cause he put it in his own air, but he had it and, and he could put it in his room if he'd like. And if he wanted to open up, he could pop the balloon and take the message out. But it was like the one time during the session that he would actually would address the grief in like the appropriate, not even appropriate terms, but like straight on. We're usually in our sessions, it's just like normal developmental, like play and activities kind of, kind of going around grief, but we're addressing grief. Um, this was like a really directive approach that he took on, um, on creating it. And I think that kind of goes back to, I think humans, we crave rituals to express our feelings. And it's almost as if he was creating his own ritual at that moment of doing that to deal with those complex emotions. Yeah. Um, and I know, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, absolutely, no, I was just saying, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, a lot of what we've looked at so far have been for younger kids, um, you know, like school age, middle school, younger. Do you have any um, activities in mind that would be better suited for teens? Because teens are going to need to work through these issues too. And just like what you were saying earlier, how even if it happened two developmental stages ago, maybe they have to reapproach it now. How, what would you recommend as tools for teens? Yeah, um, teens are great too. Oh, teens are so fun to work with. They're, they're, they're a group where I feel like a lot of people are intimidated by them. Um, but I, I they're, they're awesome. There's, I mean, they're just such a great population to, to work with. Um, cause remember what it was like to be a teenager. It's awkward. It's hard. It's, 
confusing, <laughs> so uncomfortable. Um, and I mean, can you imagine going through that while you're coping with the loss of a loved one? Like it's really intense. So different activities I do is really, again, doing the naming of emotions and kind of uh, feelings, but in, in not in like the younger version, right? So I incorporate it through games. So I'll do like therapeutic feelings, Uno or Jenga. Um, and I also will incorporate a lot of questions that are more like abstract and help them think about their future. So, you know, what, um, what is something that you want to do when you grow up or what is, what is the hardest thing about losing your loved one? Or if your loved one was alive today during the pandemic, um, what would you, what, what could they do to help you? What would you want them to say to you? Like things like that. So you really get them to start thinking and processing their grief and they're able to express it in different ways. Um, I also do the masks with them. I, it's a really fun activity. They are very creative. One of my um, other favorite activities to do with, with teens is to acknowledge what grief is, right? It's, it's also, it, it, it's, it's very similar to an ocean, right? The waves are up and down. It could be really calm one day and the next day it feels like you're just overwhelmed you can't get out of bed you're just like so just down in the dumps or you're incredibly angry those are grief emotions right it's like that storm in the sea and so i'll do activities with like seashells and we just kind of incorporate that theme of grief and then giving them an outlet so you can see the one where it says santa cruz this was a um with a teenager, she was 16 at the time and she created this and Santa Cruz was a place that she would go to all the time with her dad and she had really special memories about it. And so during the activity too, you know, she's just like opening up and she'll have conversations with me about how things are going and things that she enjoys. And we talk about coping strategies for a lot of things like how to manage um, her school schedule now, how to manage, um, her, her, her mom, how to manage um, her siblings and their grief. So it brings up a lot of opportunities. Um, another fun activity I like to do is anything about your past, your present and your future. So you can do it those three ways. You can do like a timeline, but this gives kids, this gives teenagers the opportunity to really think about things in the past. It thinks about where they are now because they're going through that identity stage and what they want in the future. And I mean, I've done some where where's a timeline. I mean, I recently did this with a team and it was this intense timeline of like, why don't you write down on here milestones about things that were everything that was great, that big important things in your life to things that were also really hard. And it was probably one of the first times, honestly, that she was able to have that opportunity to express it. And it wasn't all, re it wasn't always related to that one death, right? There was so much other stuff that had happened in her life that she was able to see, wow, like I had a lot of trauma before and look where I am today. And this is what I want in my future. This is what I want. Or look at, you know, look at how resilient I've become. I was able to still, you know, get the grades I wanted, or I was able to stay in school, or I was able to get a part-time job. Like that's also showing her, um, the empowerment and the resiliency that they have. So giving them that visual and that opportunity to, to write it out is, is great. Um, so there's so, I mean, there's so many activities you can do. I love the iceberg one too. I'm sure we've all seen that where it's like an, a giant iceberg and we talk about, you know, the top of it and, and the top of the iceberg outside of the, the water and the things that are really expressed and shown. It's kind of like the mask, but really the iceberg. Very is similar to the mask one. Yeah, but the, underneath the iceberg is gigantic. And what is all the stuff that they're dealing with that maybe a lot of people don't know? Um, and I and love the mask, the mask activity. And we actually, so in Shadow's Edge, we have a journal page and we get, you know, I agree with what you said about working with teenagers is great. Like 
at first it is daunting because they're like little adults sort of not little but they're like adults with a little less years of experience but uh we have a page where it's called the masked me and you have to journal about well what is the mask that other people see mm. and what is the actual you and that theme of covering up with a mask kind of goes from like young until even as an adult and I just I love that activity and, and just and I love the iceberg one actually I've never mm -hmm. you know seen that one but that's pretty really cool and that just I love that so yeah much. I think anytime you can give them those tools to express but then I always try to add in like the coping so with the iceberg like I added like the lifeboat and I'm like, what are your coping skills? And this was on a Zoom session um, with a teenager. So he was writing it on the, the little whiteboard that you have on Zoom. And he, he made his little boat and he typed in the things that, what his coping skills are. And he actually has a lot. Um, but the, head, the big heaviness of his loss was the loss of, um, of his, of his dog, which was incredibly traumatic for him to witness and, and cope with the whole family. And they also, a few months later lost their, their grandmother and they're dealing with the pandemic. Like again, the pandemic has created so much intensity for, for families to process. So I think that's one thing I take away for today too, is like, no, if like you're coping with a loss during this time and you just feel like, oh my gosh, this is just like, grief is horrible. It is, it is horrible, but it's also because you have so much more that you're dealing with. You have so much more trauma. You have so much more grief and you have less outlets, like less coping skills that you would typically go to. Um, so it's one thing to keep in mind and the families I've worked with this year that are related to, to death, not even related to COVID. It's not COVID deaths. I mean, it is, it's taking them so long. I mean, this poor, like, think about it. This poor little boy got kicked out of two preschools. And I go, he was literally just kind of like asking for help at that point. He was, he was screaming for help. He was screaming for help. So, and it, um, and it doesn't help that whether a passing is for COVID or not, a lot of things that we use to process our emotions and to celebrate the life of someone like funerals aren't always possible right now because of social distancing. And we're basically having to skip out on many things we would usually do to cope. Yeah. Like down to even like going out and seeing a friend that is comforting, things like that. And so, um, and we're actually about 10 minutes uh, out to um, wrapping up. And I wanted to ask one more question and then open it up for audience questions. I wanted to ask you about like, what, what, why are we so adamant about dealing with grief? Why is it so important that we start this discussion? Like, even if we're in a family that, you know, those conversations are super uncomfortable, like we're not a super expressive family, but we still need to deal with the grief and the sadness and these emotions. Why are we so adamant about why this needs to happen? Well, I think it needs to happen because you don't want to hold, hold on to it and not get support for it and not acknowledge it because that'll just get it complicated because something else is going to happen and you're going to bury it down. And then something else is going to happen. And you bury that down. You can, you're, you can only hold so much. Right. And then what happens is we know that that can get really complicated. And um, it can lead into other really unhealthy things for your mental health, right? Like you can go into that depression. You can get incredibly anxious over things if grief is not addressed. So and just like that little boy who's acting out at school, adults will act out if, if it's from long-term adult, an adult could act out later down the road from something that wasn't dealt with down to like, well, you hear about it a lot of like people who go to drinking or any yeah. unhealthy to self-destructive behaviors. Yeah, the risky behaviors. And we, we talk about that too with like adolescents, right? That we have to watch them, but it's same with adults. We, we have to, if you're not, if you don't address it yourself, if, if something, if there's been a loss in your family and you're, you're the caretaker, you yourself should get some support and, and acknowledge the grief and work through it because you need to model that because it's really healthy to do that. You need to model that for your children so that they can also 
be able to process and cope with it. Because if you don't, it, it's going to magnify it. Um, and it's going to get, it's going to get harder and you want to have co healthy coping strategies because here's, here's the reality of life. Yes. Death is really hard. It is probably one of the hardest things that people, uh, you know, cope with, but there's going to be something else. Something else is going to happen. Another type of loss or trauma will happen. Like that is how the trajectory of life goes. Like we, have different stages where we're hit with, um, with harder things. So you need to be able to, um, have strong coping skills to, to manage and work through it. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and so after, um, you know, after this, uh, webinar, uh, we're actually probably tomorrow, we're going to be sending out a link to this recording, um, with, as well as a list of different books and resources that, Shane frequently uses uh, in her practice so that you uh, you and the audience will know great resources for if someone you care about or if you yourself are dealing with grief in a younger person. Um, wanted to um, open up for questions. Let's see what we have. So, oh, so you've got, someone said that you uh, were a great speaker, speaker and they loved your examples. Oh, thank um, you. Lynn asked, what is the tissue jar activity? Can you uh, explain that one? Oh yeah, let me, um, I'll leave this up here. Essentially, okay, I got, I learned, see, I love learning from other child life specialists and other educators and counselors because they have such great, I mean, they're so creative. So I always take things and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is wonderful. I learned this from another child life specialist who works in hospice and she had this like mason jar and I, what she does, she taught me how to do it. You take tissue paper and I essentially give kids the opportunity to use the tissue paper and design it how they want it. Or if they want to match it to a memory or if they want to match it to a feeling and they cover the mason jar. And then I give them a little battery operated tea light and they put it inside. And so I tell them, and we also explain to the parents, you know, or the, the rest of the family, grief is hard. And, and there's going to be days where you're going to feel that, that sea of emotions raging, where it's going to be heavy and you're not going to know what to do. So let's represent this jar as the days that are really heavy. So when your light is on and you have it in a, in a space where the family is um, together and they notice that your, your light is on, that's going to let them know you're having a bad day. You're having a bad day. So either they should check in with you or maybe they, that's, that's a sign of like, let's check in, but also let them give them the space, like however they want to cope with it. But it gives this, I guess it gives this like permission, right. And acknowledgement to let the family know, like when you're having that hard day, like don't bother me or come check on me. Um, it's funny because the one I put on there it was a teenager and she wrote on the top of her jar, uh, don't bug me. <laughs> <laughs> and then she went ahead and put it in the, with the, with the family. But yeah. I think everybody needs one of those during the pandemic when we're all yeah. stuck at home. <laughs> yes. Like, leave me alone. A don't bug me lantern. I've got able to say it without getting, you know, being rude, right? <laughs> yeah. And then I've got some other questions for you. Um, what activities do you offer to a child who is dying to cope with their grief about their own death? Um, that's a hard one. Yeah. That's a hard one. I think that it's important of the first thing to really educate them on what's happening, right? And then giving them the, that permission to be wherever they are with it. Um, our roles, child life specialists, aren't, aren't, to, aren't to change. We're not there to analyze. We're really there to meet the child where they're at and help them cope with it. So if a child gets to a place where they're accepting and they know this is happening, then what a great opportunity to give them to create things for their loved ones. What legacy do they want to have? Do they want to create a bucket list? Do they want to... Um, do video messages for their, for their loved ones? Do they want to create something or um, 
that's on a different scale where they can still feel like they're, they know they're dying, but, and they know their family is going to be craving immensely, but how can they still feel like they're connected? So I think it's still the same type of stuff with the memory making activities, but it's at a different, it's at a different, um, level. And it's also at a place where, um, again, just meeting the child where they're at. Yeah. And I, I can't imagine that's probably one of the harder ways to approach out of what you do in your profession, especially his adults, probably in an adult who's, you know, gotten to a certain point in life and they're having to deal with that is already hard enough. So I can't imagine the child having to experience that. Um, yeah. But I think it depends too, because you can have some adults who are, I mean, they just aren't, they're, they're not going to verbally accept it. And I think that, um, or just accept it in general until it, it's actually, it's, it's happened or it's happening. Um, and then there's others who are more accepting. So again, it's that grief process for everybody is, it's a personal journey. So one person asked, and I think this would be really important is how do you introduce these activities? Uh, sometimes I find patients shut down and it can be hard to get them to be willing to be vulnerable enough to engage in these types of activities at all. Ah, you just answered your own question. They are, if it is vulnerable, if it's too much for them, you have to respect it. You have to meet them where they're at. Um, for instance, with that, with that, with that little boy who was getting kicked out of the preschools, um, there was a point where he, when he was just in this grief state where he was just so angry and I had been working with him already for like six or seven months. We had very good rapport. Um, when I would bring in activities and books, he was like, nope. He would literally tell me, he was like, Shani, stop. And I was like, okay. And I was like, it, it was always in the theme. It wasn't me asking him like, how do you feel? Or that must make you sad. Like, uh -uh. I took it all completely off of him. And I would just stay just in the metaphor of play. And I was like, oh, Batman is so sad. And he would just look at me like this and he goes, stop. Like, I know what you're doing. He, he knew what I was doing. And I was like, you're right. I'm like, I, I just loved it. I love that he could call me out on it. And I was respectful. He's not ready. I'm not going to push. I'm going to pull back. I'm going to keep just doing child-centered stuff. And when he's ready, it'll come back up. And sure enough, I mean, within a few other sessions, boom, we were right back to where he was comfortable with it. He started expressing again about mom. He was able to identify feelings, but you just have to meet them where they're at. So what is your end goal? Is your, is your therapeutic goal to get them to create something or is your therapeutic goal to meet them where they're at so that they feel comfortable to either create or just feel like they're, they're being validated. Just your presence there alone is doing so much. Um, so that would my, that would be my answer is to just, to meet them where they're at. And, um, you know, something that, uh, I, we keep referring to that one little boy and I just yeah. feel like what he's gone like through has been something that a kid never should have to go through, but I think it's going to make him super resilient and he's going to be a really awesome and spunky adult. Yeah. Like he's going to be. I think so too. Yeah. Being when he's I know. Life. I just finished. I'm just wrapped. I have one more session with him. So we're going through our termination stages right now where it was no. uh, saying goodbye. And he was so upset by it. But again, saying goodbye, um, when you do grief support too, you have to um, recognize that when your time is done with them, it's another loss. And so I was very clear and we have very concrete things that he can identify with our time ending. And we did a lot of memory making activities between the two of us that we have had this therapeutic relationship for a year now. And my time with him for grief support is ended. He has got great skills. His family is coping really well and he's gonna be able to move on. Um, but it's also that, you know, the dad's like now understands child life so well. And he's like, so I know that when he gets to school age, Shannon, I might have to reach back out again. And I'm like, that's right. When he gets to school age and, and you notice he's trying to reprocess it again, just give me a ring. And just what you do is amazing. Uh, grief is not a discussion I've seen enough of 
especially for kids. And just so what you do is absolutely amazing. And thank you for taking the time to share your insight and your expertise expertise with us, either whether someone on who's listening in is a also a child life specialist or just a parent or someone who loves someone who's going through grief. Um, but if anyone has any questions, um, I know we've run out of time and uh, Shaney's got to get back to doing her amazing work. Um, <laughs> if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out um, to feedback at diggingdeep.org and then we will, we can either, uh, you know, ask uh, for you or connect you. And we'll also, again, be sending out a newsletter with a link to the recording and uh, a list of resources. And if anyone needs, I know there was a question in the comments, if anyone needs a certificate to say that they were uh, attending this live webinar, feel free to also email and ask for that. Um, not everyone needs it, but we will make one for you if you need it for work or anything of that sort. So thank you so much, everyone. This was amazing and have an amazing Tuesday. <laughs>